A new industry would be created in the United States for the purpose of building American rigid airships. The old Army weapons testing range of Camp Kendrick, New Jersey became Naval Air Station Lakehurst. Construction on a steel shed big enough to house two rigid airships began on September 8, 1919. The Navy began conceptual planning in September 1919. The original German L-49 structure design was strengthened and the bow was modernized with a mooring cone and provisioning connections. Alcoa's Arthur Vining Davis set his company to solve what he called the Zeppelin problem by duplicating metal samples from the captured L-49. The result was Alcoa's duraluminum, the airship metal. The Naval Aircraft Factory in Philadelphia fabricated the girder structure. Commander Ralph Weyerbacher of the U.S. Navy Bureau of Construction and Repair supervised the construction. Girders were trucked into Lakehurst and assembled starting in April 1922. Packard Motor Cars' Jesse Vincent, who had created the wartime Liberty 12A engine, oversaw the creation of the Packard IA. 1551 power plant for airship use. If the Versailles Treaty could be sidestepped, a real Zeppelin could be built for America. But the Inter-Ally Aeronautical Commission of Control resisted the idea. With the loss of so many Americans on the British-built R-38, swayed attitudes toward the American request. In June 1922, a contract for the new Zeppelin was signed. Reluctant to share design secrets, the Zeppelin company had to be reminded that it was the U.S. Navy's desire for a rigid airship that saved the company from being torn down by the Allies. Zeppelin management expended every effort to make LZ-126 the best rigid ever built. The work offered pride to the demoralized German people. To satisfy the former allies, the LZ-126 was to be smaller than the Americans requested, and the airship would be non-military, limited to civil purposes. Construction of what was expected to be the biggest, best, and last Zeppelin progressed methodically. In America, ZR-1 was completed on August 20th, 1923. 15,000 people watched her being walked out for her first flight on September 4th. Her first captain was Commander Frank McCrary. ZR-1 made three local flights, and on the 11th of September, she flew over New York City. All of America wanted to see the new airship in a bold move for so inexperienced a ship and crew. On the 1st of October, ZR-1 flew to the National Air Races at St. Louis. Crowds who had only seen Zeppelins in the movies were thrilled. Remaining on the ground without any mooring equipment was rather risky in itself, and on the return flight, the horizontal fin was damaged. Then, returning to Lakehurst, thousands of cubic feet of precious helium had to be valved to bring the airship down. The ZR-1 was christened Shenandoah by the wife of Secretary of the Navy, Edwin H. Denby, on October 10th. Shenandoah was an Indian name, meaning Daughter of the Stars. One of the commissioned vessel's first tasks was to try out the new Lakehurst High Mast, to which she moored successfully on November 16, 1923. During repeated attempts, the proper mooring technique was developed. In preparation for a proposed flight to the Arctic, the ZR-1 was left out on the Lakehurst High Mast. On January 16, 1924, winds that reached over 70 miles per hour tore fabric from the upper fin. The next gust caught her broadside and tore the ship from the mast. The mooring fitting was ripped from the bow, leaving a gaping hole and deflating the two forward gas cells. With skillful handling by the skeleton crew aboard, under ex-Zeppelin pilot and training officer Anton Heinen, ZR-1 
rode out the storm, and safely landed at Lakehurst the next morning. While workers repaired the Shenandoah, over in Germany, the ZR-3 was slowly taking shape. The workers were in no hurry to finish what seemed to be their last job. Resident Naval Inspector Garland Fulton required the reluctant Germans to share their design philosophy and methodology of stress analysis. Although often referred to as a reparations airship, it was considered compensation for the two Zeppelins to have been awarded to the U.S., but destroyed by their crews. Cost to the German government was $713,332, but the U.S. government only paid $150,000. This bargain price included spare engines and crew training. Back at Lakehurst, Shenandoah was ready to fly again. The ZR-1's sixth engine had been removed from the forward car and radio equipment installed in its place. Lieutenant Commander Zachary Lansdowne took command of the USS Shenandoah in February 1924. Shenandoah was the first rigid airship to operate with the restrictions imposed by helium gas. To help compensate for the consumption of fuel weight, Lakehurst personnel developed condensing equipment to recover water from the engine exhaust. They folded 3,000 feet of aluminum tubing into a 450-pound cube and attached it to the Packard exhaust pipe. The condensers were heavy and hampered performance. On August 8, 1924, Shenandoah became the first airship to moor to a mast aboard a ship at sea. The oiler USS Potoka had been converted to an airship tender. When moored, the airship's nose was 12 stories above the waterline, while 80-foot booms managed the yaw lines. Potoka carried over 32,000 gallons of gasoline for the airship. She also had thousands of helium bottles, as well as a hydrogen generator in case the helium ran out. In Germany, there had been delays getting airship engines. Finally, workers walked the LZ-126 out of her hangar on August 27, 1924. In the coming weeks, five flights were made over Germany and Switzerland. The final checkout and training flight lasted almost 34 hours and carried 71 persons aloft. The Navy's contract with Zeppelin would be concluded when the new airship was delivered to the United States. Since only one airship had actually crossed the Atlantic, careful planning was required to ensure the ship could safely make the trip. From Lakehurst, the Shenandoah began what was called the Rim Flight, a transcontinental circuit on October 6, 1924. She moored to temporary high-mast mooring facilities at Fort Worth, Texas, San Diego, California, and Camp Lewis near Tacoma, Washington. While the Shenandoah was circling the United States, the long-dreaded last day of the Zeppelin works came when the LZ-126 departed Friedrichshafen on October 12, 1924. For the crossing, in addition to the crew of 27, three U.S. Navy and one Army servicemen were on board. Reaching New York with most of its fuel exhausted on October 15th, she safely landed at Lakehurst. The delivery flight complete, LZ-126 entered the hangar and officially became the ZR-3. Navy men shored up and suspended the dirigible when the hydrogen was vented from her gas cells. All Lakehurst's remaining helium was used to take up some of the strain, filling the cells to 5%. Shenandoah returned to Lakehurst on October 25th having demonstrated the ability to operate a great distance from her main base. She had established a record for the longest journey made by any airship. Since the new ship had priority to make training flights before her German instructors went home, Shenandoah was shored and suspended so her helium could be moved over to ZR-3. Now buoyant with helium for the first time, ZR-3 flew to Washington, D.C on October 25, 1924. Rear Admiral Moffat and his officers hosted a White House delegation 
as the former German Zeppelin was gently landed with manpower alone. First Lady Grace Coolidge christened ZR-3 the USS Los Angeles. The president and the official party listened to the national anthem while balloons were released to mark the event. Calvin Coolidge's brief visit aboard was the only time a president's flag flew from a rigid airship. Upon returning to Lakehurst, the crew had to vent precious helium for more than six minutes to enable the Los Angeles to land. In the coming months, many refinements would be made for helium operations. Shenandoah's water recovery radiators were borrowed. Antifreeze had to be added to the water recovery system after some units froze solid. The Los Angeles practiced mooring to the Lakehurst High Mast. On January 15, 1925, it made the first of many moorings to the mast vessel USS Potoka. Over the 24th and 25th of January 1925, the Los Angeles hosted a group of scientists and flew off Nantucket in search of a perfect position to view a solar eclipse. America was proud of its two silver airships, great symbols of national prestige. But as humorist Will Rogers noted, the United States has only one set of helium. In June 1925, Los Angeles returned to Hangar 1 and her helium gas was moved back into the Shenandoah. Personnel found the calcium chloride antifreeze had corroded the Los Angeles' aluminum structure. The damage was so severe, girders had to be ordered from Germany and replaced. From then on, only alcohol antifreeze was to be used. ZR-1 observed some war exercises in which Army General William Billy Mitchell used to demonstrate his belief that air power made battleships obsolete. Since the Navy had to share helium with the Army, scarcity of lifting gas put a limit on operations. Then an accident with a Lakehurst helium storage tank suddenly allowed more than 400,000 cubic feet of the precious gas to escape. Together, the two airship's gas was leaking to the degree that it was going to exceed the Navy's helium allotment. At Lansdowne's direction, Lakehurst workers removed some ZR-1 cell valves and rigged jam pot covers over emergency valves to slow the leakage during flight. Flights along the East Coast and maneuvers with the fleet were conducted. The Shenandoah performed scout operations with the battleship USS Texas. Moorings to the Potoka in Bar Harbor, Maine were conducted through July and August of 1925. There was even serious discussion of carrying an airplane on the airship. Admiral William Moffat continued to push for flights inland to rally public support. On September 2nd, the Shenandoah departed on a flight that was to cover the Midwest Fair Circuit. It was an ambitious plan that required flying almost 1,330 miles. ZR-1 would also moor to the mast which Henry Ford built at Dearborn, Michigan. In the early morning hours of the 3rd of September, 1925, Shenandoah was fighting to keep on schedule while she was being buffeted by a storm over Noble County, Ohio. Severe vertical currents carried her upward faster than helium could escape the cells. Suddenly, there was a structural failure along the main longitudinals where the hull was heavy and the airship broke in two. Eight men, including the captain, Zachary Lansdowne, were in the control car and it fell. Two heavy engine cars also broke free and plummeted to earth, taking three men to their deaths. The stern broke free with the other engine cars. The bow, with seven men aboard, gained altitude and floated for several miles before it dragged across a roof and settled on the farm of Ernest and Phoebe Nichols. Navy airshipmen borrowed a shotgun and blew holes in the cells. The central part of the hull settled down on the farm of Andy and Mary Gamory. The county fairgrounds were nearby and word of the accident was passed quickly. The bow also attracted scavengers. Fourteen men died in the accident. Charles E. Rosendahl 
the officer who free ballooned the nose section safely to the ground, was credited for saving the men in the bow. Alcoa feared corrosion had contributed to the accident, but corrosion was not the cause. Alcoa went on to develop an even stronger airship metal for future Zeppelin construction. The U.S. Navy still had one Zeppelin, but most of their helium had escaped over Ohio. <laughs> 